Well, good morning, South Hills, and welcome. We're so glad that you're with us today uh, on this first Sunday of June as we're moving into the summer. We're so glad that you're here with us. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here. We want to welcome you, and as part of our family, we want to get to know you. And uh, if there's any way that we can minister to you or help you, please let us know. Uh, we have QR codes around the building. You can scan one of those with your phone and fill out a, a contact information. Or uh, one of our greeters out front likely may have already asked you to give us some information so that we can reach out to you and say thank you for worshiping with us this week. I also hope that you receive our digital bulletin each and every week so that you know what's going on and happening in the life of our church. If you don't get that, then let us know and we'll get you signed up so that goes to your inbox every Sunday morning uh, before small group. And so one of those things in there that I want to point out to you is this Tuesday night, uh, we're having a church-wide prayer meeting, a church-wide prayer gathering, and we invite you to join us here at 6.30, okay, 6.30 here on Tuesday night, and uh, we're just going to pray for one another, pray for our church, pray for our community, uh, and just seek the Lord together, because prayer is the foundation uh, of God working and moving in a mighty way uh, in our midst, and so, but thank you so much for being here today. We're kicking off our, our media improvement project campaign Today, you're going to hear more about that in our service, but hopefully you received an email, heard some information about it, but if not, you're going to hear about it today and what God's up to and what he's doing as we're seeking him to enhance our uh, effectiveness and our reach uh, through media and through sound and through technology, and so we're excited about that. It's going to be a great day of worship, uh, and as we begin, I want to lead us in prayer. Will you join me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the way, thank you for the way uh, that you love us, the way that you provide for us. That above all else, you've given us your son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, who has become our hope and our joy and our source of life. And God, if anyone has not put their faith in Jesus and hasn't experienced the life-changing power of your love and your grace, that today might be a day that their life has changed forever. God, empower us as we worship you. We want to glorify your name. We want to celebrate you with all that we are and with all that we have. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayers. fighting for us and his angels all around my delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown you're my help and my defender you're my savior and my friend by your grace i live and breathe to worship you at the mention of your greatness in your name i will bow down in your presence, fear is silenced, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you.
So over uh, we were exploring uh, what it looked like to enhance uh, our audio, our video, uh, as we had a single camera that we had purchased the year before that we were using for our live stream. And uh, at this point in time last year, uh, we were in week 13, I believe, of online only worship. And we were able to begin back in the middle of June, meeting in person, and we're thankful for that, and we're thankful now uh, to see God bringing more and more of our church family and others in our community back in person to our worship services. But we understand the significance uh, of online presence and online ministry and, and the media that it takes uh, to do that well. And, and so over the course of this last year, we've been researching, we've been meeting, we've been praying, and last month... Uh, we made the decision uh, in our church business meeting at the recommendation of our stewardship committee uh, along with uh, a task force of others who had been researching and working with uh, various bids and various companies uh, for us to upgrade, uh, adding additional cameras, uh, adding uh, additional uh, sound equipment, um, video equipment, uh, and many things for our, our praise band and praise team here on the platform. And so we stepped out in faith, and we purchased that, and we signed the contract at the cost of $50,000. And we took that money uh, from some of our cash reserves here at the church. Uh, and, and our desire and goal was to help cast the vision and engage our entire church family through a three-month process in June, July, and August this summer, starting today, to help raise those funds to pay for this upgrade that's much needed. Uh, and so today we kick off that campaign and we're asking you to give, to prayerfully consider what God would have you to give, maybe one time, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly, maybe monthly, but to prayerfully consider what God would have you to give above and beyond your regular tithes and your regular offerings that you give already to help support this vital aspect of ministry. And so we kick that off today. We're not having a special time where we have a basket at the front and ask you to come uh, and to, to physically give, but in your regular giving, your regular offering, the way that you normally do that, whether that's online, whether that's here in person, there are offering boxes that are on either side of the sound booth or uh, in the lobby by the north entrance when you come in through the main offices, uh, or whatever method that might be uh, over the next few months. We're asking you to prayerfully consider joining us in this campaign to help make a difference and move us forward drastically in what God's called us to be uh, in the area of media and audio and video, enhancing not only the worship in the room, but the worship online. And we want you to watch this video that helps cast the vision uh, for what's happening and what's going on through this media improvement project. <laughs> The front door to the church used to be the front door. With the advancement of technology, websites became new entry points. Another shift occurred this past year as live streaming worship opened new doors for people to come to church. This has revealed a need for us to enhance the way we approach media and worship. The purpose of the church is for Christians to be able to gather together and be a disciple, to grow in their faith together. Once we become Christians and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God wants us to grow and develop so that we can help lead others to faith in Christ. And the church is the people gathered. And when we gather together, we're encouraging one another, we're strengthening one another, we're helping one another grow in our faith so that we're better equipped to go out into the world and to share the gospel and help lead others to faith in Christ. Our mission as the church is helping people find and follow Jesus. So when we first started this, everything was very much a kind of getting what we could get our hands on because with everything with the pandemic, it slowed down electronics, it slowed down a lot of pieces we had to get. But it also was just kind of us just starting it. We didn't know really even what we were doing when it kind of started. We have definitely learned as we went and we've grown as we've, as we've done it and we've seen just the opportunities. We've seen how worship is changing and what this new this new way of worshiping is for people and that the online space is a, is a place that people are going to be at and we want to meet them there. We want to improve worship for them online, but also this is going to help improve ways to just reach them with new forms of media and new forms of doing things through social media. And so 
our biggest thing is to help people find and follow Jesus, and one of the ways to do that is to meet them where they are, and one of the places they are is online. In-ear monitors will help the band to stay together and free us to worship. Higher quality cameras will present a more accurate view and a clearer opinion of what South Hills is all about and will help online people to learn more about us. A digital console will bring uh, a clearer and more perfect sound to the audience in the church and online and it will help the instrumentalists and vocalists to hear clearly what they present to the church. This new AV system is going to benefit our church. First, our praise team and praise band rehearsals are going to run a lot smoother. Um, also looking at our online worship on Sundays, the distractions will be minimal. And then we'll, we will be able to target the, the newer generations who live in the virtual space, not just in the physical space. So being able to reach them as well. Worship is the front door to the church, and we strive for excellence in everything that we do, which is why we are upgrading our audio and video equipment here at the church so that we can more effectively connect people to South Hills. Even though we have new entry points to the church, the result of each of these is more people walking through those same old church doors. Let's pray. Father, for some it may just, it may feel. just feel like equipment, physical stuff, uh, nicer things. But God, there's, uh, we know that we have an opportunity to reach out far beyond this physical building, far beyond this physical property. And through technology and through media and through the world that we live in today that's rapidly advancing and rapidly changing, it's incredible to think that, that right here, from 7350 Granbury Road, from this physical address, we can help spread the gospel far beyond the walls of this church, far beyond uh, the, the sidewalks that, that surround this property, uh, into our neighborhoods and, and uh, across our region, across the state, across the country, and even all over the world. And God, we want to do our best and be the best stewards that we can with every aspect of ministry that you've given us. And so, God, we're stepping out in faith today, and we're asking you to provide. We're asking you to compel the hearts of our people to give sacrificially, to, to buy into the vision of what it means to help people find and follow Jesus, to help spread the message of the hope of your son, Jesus Christ, in fresh new ways. And yes, in some ways it will, will, will make it easier, but it will enhance the opportunities that we have. God, we're thankful for the equipment that we have. We're thankful uh, for the soundboard that came with us from the old location uh, over 15 years ago that, that's still working. But God, there's so many things that, that we're seeking to do, and we believe that this avenue of, of media and technology is going to be a huge asset to the ministry of South Hills Baptist Church. And so God, please help us to strive for excellence in all that we do, but continue to maintain the focus of doing everything we can to take the gospel across the street and around the world. And so God, today, even in this moment, compel us to see and embrace the vision that you've given us, to, to allow us to buy in, not only with, with our hearts and with our minds, but with our resources and with our time and with our energy, so that together we can reach one more person with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can see one more life change for the glory of God. Lord, provide for us as you always have, and allow us to see what it is you want us to do and where it is you want us to go, and lead us there for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And you'll join me in praying each and every day, each and every week, as we seek to make a difference uh, through not only meeting in person, but also online. We're going to continue to worship. We're going to continue to celebrate together this morning. So thank you, church family. Please stand.
Let's tell our testimony through song. We were one way, and we are a new way because of Jesus and what he has done and the receiving of that through faith. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew. i 
you have it all. Take our hearts as our offering. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure. heaven let's sing high king of heaven my victory won may i reach heaven's joys oh bright heaven's sun part of my own heart whatever befall still be my vision oh As I've said many times before, I'm incredibly thankful for our tech team and our media team and all those volunteers who helped make that happen, Chip and Daniel and Aaron working so diligently in the beginning to get our live stream going so online audience know that you're important to us. And yes, we want you here in the room. There's a dramatic difference of being online and in the room. And if you're able, we want you in the room but we also want you to know that it's going to be greatly enhanced uh, in, in the months ahead as we improve our technology, and so we're thankful for that. This morning we're going to conclude our series in the book of Nehemiah, in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. We've been looking at, it, at this story of rebuilding and restoration uh, through the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be in a couple of different places in these final few chapters uh, of Nehemiah. I wish I could have been here on August the 27th, 2006, for the first service in this building at South Hills Baptist Church. I can imagine uh, all the excitement uh, after, let's be honest, the heartache, the toil, the, the labor, the, the loss, the, the, the uncertainties. The, the fact that God gave you, the people, His church, a vision and a calling to relocate, to find a fresh start. And God gave us, gave you that fresh start right here at 7350 Granbury Road. All the praying, all, all the planning, all the hard work had paid off. Unfortunately, it also included dealing with some opposition and overcoming some slander and some manipulation. Because any time that you're doing what God's called you to do, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be resistance. There's going to be pain. You see, experiencing a fresh start is something that so many people want, that so many people dream of, so many people desire and hope for. But few of us really get an opportunity to do so. Whether it's in a relationship, whether it's uh, in a career, or maybe it's in chasing a dream. If you get the chance for a fresh start, take it and make the most of it. Maximize the opportunity. You see, when God called Nehemiah to leave working uh, next to the king of Persia in a high-ranking position, and the, and the poshness of the kingdom. And to go to Jerusalem, a city that was somewhat in ruins, and help rebuild the wall, help restore God's people. 
He did all he could to take advantage of the opportunity. He didn't want to miss his chance for a fresh start for God's people in God's city. And he depended upon God and stepped out in faith. So as we've journeyed through this book of Nehemiah together, we've seen the prayer, we've seen the planning, we've seen the hard work that led to the wall being rebuilt in 52 days. All the resources, all the the people, all the, the appointments and details that God lined up so that Nehemiah could lead the people to rebuild the wall. We've seen the community being repopulated and, and Jews coming back home to live inside the city and the city being reestablished and given a new sense of revitalized life. And as we finish today, we're going to see the spiritual renewal. We're going to see the dedication ceremony that took place uh, that culminated uh, at the end of the story. Now, there was a huge celebration once the wall was complete. We get a glimpse of that in Nehemiah chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 27. It says that the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent the Levites wherever they lived and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous occasion, dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied with cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers gathered from the region around Jerusalem, from the settlements of, of the Nedophathites, uh, from Beth Gilgal, and from the fields of, of Geba, the Asmaveth. And for they had built settlements for themselves around Jerusalem. After the priests and Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people, the city gates, and the wall. And then I brought the leaders of Judah up on top of the wall and appointed two large processions and gave thanks. It goes on to say that one group he sent one way on the wall, another group he sent on another way of the wall, and they were they were singing and and playing their instruments and shouting and and celebrating, and they 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 came together uh, at the other end of the wall. And jumping down to verse 43, it says, On that day they offered great sacrifices. And rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated. And Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. It was a great celebration. They partied hard. They they celebrated big as they paraded around the top of the wall. Did any of y'all parade around on top of the building back in August of 2006? If so, I haven't seen any pictures or video. But that, that, that would have been good. See, this dedication was the crowning moment for a people who had given so much, who had sacrificed so diligently, and were now experiencing the fulfillment of God's promise in their life, in their city. And so so all the surrounding cities would have taken notice. Far away they could see and hear the celebration. And the glory of God was on full display. But before the party, they assembled together to hear God's word and worship and learn through the reading and the teaching of God's word. They spent time corporately confessing their sins. And then they renew their covenant with God. And this was the most important aspect of the whole experience. You see, the spiritual is so much more vital than the physical. You see, you can build an impressive house. You can can build a, a beautiful house But if you're not striving to establish a healthy spiritual home inside of that house, then you're not going to bring glory to God. You see, the wall was complete. The wall was an impressive sight. The city, the the temple had been rebuilt. the, The wall had been rebuilt and restored and repaired. And everything was in place. And it was nice and it was new and it was it was pretty and it was strong and it was powerful. But what's more impressive is their desire to get right spiritually so they can more effectively glorify God and experience the blessings of the presence of God. 
You see, we would do well to prioritize getting right with God spiritually so that we can know Him more intimately and serve Him more effectively. God can give us an incredible property with room to grow and and meaningful buildings and and, an impressive website and and, and, and nice... uh, sharp new cameras and and crisp new sound and uh, um, exciting programs and events and all of those things. But if on the inside we're not seeking spiritual renewal, we're not seeking spiritual dependence upon God to lead us and to guide us and to shape us and to mold us so that we can know Him more intimately and serve Him more effectively, then we might as well be an empty shell an abandoned property. You see, after corporate confession, we saw this last week in Nehemiah chapter 9, the Israelites renew their covenant with God. And in verse 38 of chapter 9, after the, after the reading of the word and after the corporate confession, it says, in view of all of this, we're making a binding agreement in writing on a sealed document containing the names of our leaders, Levites and priests. You see, when we understand our sinfulness, when we understand uh, how dramatically we fall short of the glory of God in our lives, and we willingly come before God seeking forgiveness, it opens up the door for spiritual renewal. And the natural result of that should lead to a strong desire to follow Jesus and seek to honor Jesus in all aspects of our lives. You see, genuine reconciliation takes confession and commitment. And we need to be honest. We need to be honest with God about who we are. We need to be honest with God about what we've done. And we need to be honest in recognizing what God expects of us. So they've confessed, and and now they're making a covenant not, not, just a, not just a shallow promise, not just a, you know, fair weather commitment. A covenant. A covenant is a strong, solemn agreement that brings a change in relationship. Covenants are a big deal. Marriage is a covenant. Church membership is a covenant. In fact, we would, we, we would um, do well to take a stronger covenant approach to church membership in our churches and establish a deeper understanding of what that commitment involves and what it means to identify with the local church. But in this covenant that the Israelites are making with with the Lord is they're committing themselves to the law of God and to the people of God. They're committing themselves to to the word of God and to the people of God. Is your life committed to the word of God and to the people of God? through your faith in Jesus Christ? Is your life committed to God's truth and God's way? Is your life committed to God's people through your faith in Jesus Christ? Because if your faith is in Jesus Christ, then the priorities of your life ought to align with the priorities of Jesus. And Jesus lived in obedience to God's word. He took God's word seriously. And he wanted to follow God's word and fulfill God's word. And then he established the church so that the people of God could be gathered together to grow together. And so the word of God was a priority for Jesus. The people of God and the established church was a priority for Jesus. Therefore, if Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, we're fully committed to following Jesus, then we ought to be fully committed to the word of God and to the people of God. Now, chapter 10 lists those who signed the covenant, and I'm going to spare you reading that because I'll mispronounce most of them anyway. And then we get to the end of chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, and listen to what it says. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and temple servants, along with their wives, sons, and daughters, everyone who's able to understand and who separated themselves from the surrounding peoples to obey the law of God, join with their noble brothers and commit themselves with a sworn oath to follow the law of God given through God's servant Moses and to obey carefully all the commands, ordinances, and statutes 
of the Lord our Lord. You see, these covenant terms mirrored the covenant that God made with Abraham on Mount Sinai back earlier in the Old Testament, if you remember that story. And this signed covenant gave them a clear picture of who's in and who's out. It gave them a clear picture of, of who's making this commitment, who, who's really in. Some people say they're in, but if they're willing to, to sign the covenant, then we know that they're in. And their covenant was to live in obedience to God's commands in Scripture. And this acknowledgement of God's way sets out for us uh, the importance of what it means to be serious about following God's command. The people of Israel were serious about following God's command because they know firsthand what it's been like when they don't follow God's command. Hence the being overtaken by enemy countries, being exiled as slaves for generations. And now God's been gracious enough to allow them to come back and rebuild and reestablish and to renew the covenant that they had already made with him before. So let's read and see in Nehemiah chapter 10, picking up in verse 30, what this covenant was about. It says, we will not give our daughters in marriage to the surrounding peoples and will not take their daughters as wives for our sons. When the surrounding peoples bring merchandise of any kind of grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. We'll also leave the land uncultivated in the seventh year and we'll cancel every debt. We'll impose the following commands on ourselves. To give an eighth of an ounce of silver yearly for the service of the house of God. The bread displayed before the Lord, the daily grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbath and new moon offerings, the appointed festivals, the holy things, the sin offerings to atone for Israel, and for all the work of the house of our God. That's a lot of offerings. We've cast lots among the priests, Levites and people, for the donation of wood by our ancestral families at the appointed times each year. They're to bring the wood to our God's house to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it's written in the law. We'll bring the first fruits of our land and of every fruit tree of the Lord's house year by year. We'll also bring the firstborn of our sons and our livestock as prescribed by the law. And we'll bring the firstborn of our herds and flocks to the house of our God. To the priests who serve in our God's house. We'll bring a loaf from our first batch of dough to the priest at the storerooms of the house of our God. We also bring the first fruits of our grain offering of every fruit tree and of the new wine and fresh oil. A tenth of our land's produce belongs to the Levites, for the Levites are to collect the one-tenth offering in all of our agricultural towns. A priest from Aaron's descendants is to accompany the Levites when they collect the tenth, and the Levites are to take a tenth of this offering to the storerooms of the treasury and the house of our God. For the Israelites and the Levites are to bring the contributions of grain, new wine, and fresh oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are kept and where the priests who minister are, along with the gatekeepers and singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Now that's a lot of offerings. Uh, that's a lot of tenths and, and eighths and, and, and when to bring them in certain ceremonies. But they were serious about wanting to covenant with God and wanting to live in obedience to God and wanting to take seriously who God was and what God has given them and what God's blessed them with. And, and so in this summary section of the covenant, we see three aspects. We see marriage, we see Sabbath, and we see temple. And so first they agreed to no longer intermarry with the surrounding nations. They chose to no longer intermarry with the pagans. Now, historically, this was a problem. This had gotten them in a lot of trouble in the years past and caused lots of issues. You see, marriage is a covenant. And marriage displays the way that God loves his people and is committed to his people. You see, the problem with intermarrying wasn't racial, but spiritual. The problem with intermarrying that, that God is, is calling them to, that they're committing to, it isn't a racial issue. It's a spiritual issue. Because they're intermarrying with pagans and idolaters, 
people who don't know God, who don't love God, who don't fear God, and who don't follow God. Marrying someone of a different race, of a different ethnicity, of a different nationality, of a different culture is perfectly acceptable and I believe ought to be celebrated. The problem arises when two people come together in the covenant of marriage, but their spiritual loyalties are different. That's where we have a problem. That's where we have a conflict. Because more often than not, the people who are far from God are going to pull the people who are close to God further from God rather than those who are close to God pulling the people far from God in in the covenant of marriage. Now, God's called us as Christians, as believers, to go into the world and to reach the world and to build relationships with those who don't know Jesus Christ and lead them to faith in Jesus Christ and to be able to influence them and pull them in by God's Holy Spirit and by God's power to know Jesus and to follow Jesus. But a marriage relationship is not the mission field for bringing the lost to be saved. That shouldn't be our intention. Our intention in relationships, our intention in covenant marriage is to be equally yoked together with fellow believers. A good friend of mine, Mike, who's been working in student ministry at, at his home church for probably 25 years, and Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and trips, and camps, and disciples, g- boys groups regularly all the time. And I remember uh, when we were graduating high school and college, and uh, friends with him, uh, and, and to this day as he meets with students and talks with them and builds relationships with them, he always tells them, don't date anybody who's not a growing Christian. Don't like someone who's not a growing Christian. Try, try hard not to fall for someone who's not seeking to follow Christ in the way that you're following Christ. Because it's easy to like someone. It's easy to, to fall in love. Falling in love can sometimes be a lot easier than we think it is. But it's not so easy to have a thriving relationship if you're not both committed to Jesus. And I'll say this. If you're not married to someone who knows Jesus, if you're, not married, if you're married and, and, and your spouse is not a follower of Christ and, and doesn't believe in Jesus, has surrendered their life to Christ, love them deeply every day. Pray for them daily. Set the example for them in your faith and in your life. And pray that God would redeem them, that God would restore them, that God would transform them and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Because God can be honored in that. But from the beginning, from the outset, if you're not married, then make sure that you're seeking to unite with one and connect with one who shares the same values that you share in Jesus Christ. They're committing not to intermarry with the pagans. Because it had caused all kinds of problems and heartache and difficulty. They also agreed to keep the Sabbath and the Sabbath year. You see, the concept of Sabbath that God commands in Scripture is to rest from labor. To rest from working. Because working hard is important. But resting and recovering is important. When God created the world, it says on the seventh day, He rested. He shows us the need to to step away from the work and the labor and the toil and to be renewed, to be refreshed, and to worship. You see, we're supposed to work hard, but we're also to rest. And a rest allows God to restore us. And observing the Sabbath, observing rest, declares that our faith is in God and that He can and will provide. Now, see, the Sabbath year was something that they were committing to as well. And that was every seventh year. And every seventh year, all the debts were canceled. Boy, don't you wish we practiced that today? I'd I'd like for the car payment to go away, the house payment to go away. I'd like for the, the debt of South Hills Baptist Church to go away. But every seventh year, they they canceled the debts, and it took deep faith and obedience to trust God to provide. Imagine someone owes you a large sum of money. You've invested in them, and this seventh year comes along. If you're the one who owes the money, you're excited out of your mind. If you're the one who is owed the money, you're probably scared to death. Am I going to observe what God's called me to do and keep my covenant with Him and trust Him to provide even though I'm canceling this debt? Or am I going to continue to seek dependence on the stuff of this world to provide for me? 
In that seventh year, they also allowed the land to rest. And think about this. Agriculture and, and, and farming, that was their way of life. They couldn't just go down here to the neighborhood uh, Walmart and just grab the groceries that they needed. They allowed the land, the, the land to rest and to not plant and harvest the crops so the land could rest and, and, and be replenished. And that took faith. It wasn't just some observance that they, they felt like they needed to do. You see, Sabbath is obedience and evidence of faith, and it's declaring trust in God. And then that long section we read, they agreed to support the ministry of the temple. The temple was where people came to worship in God's presence. The temple was where the presence of God resided in the Old Testament. It was a sacred place. It was an important place. And temple worship was about being with God. It was about knowing God and enjoying being in God's presence. And so supporting the temple ministry was an act of faith, an act of allegiance, an act of commitment. You see, money and resources were sacrificed and were given on behalf of the people so that the temple could function, so that God could be glorified in their gifts. They needed, they needed animals for the priests to be able to sacrifice and make atonement. The, 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 the Levites who were the priests were working in the temple and committed their lives to the service of the temple. They didn't have other jobs. They depended on the work of the temple and the people of God to provide what they needed. Uh, and they served faithfully, trusting that God was going to provide for them. Now, now, fast forward, and Jesus comes, and he, he, he dies and rises again and sends the power of his Holy Spirit to us. And through that, we get God's presence in us, in our hearts, and in our lives, and we are the temple. Ch a church building is important and sacred and meaningful. It's a sacred space. But you are a sacred space if you know Jesus Christ because God's Spirit resides inside of you. We're the temple. But what the temple ministry was in the Old Testament, the church ministry is for us today. And it's important for us to see that God's design for the church is for the ministry to be supported by the people in the church. We're the ones who give to support not only those who work in the church, but it funds the ministries of the church. The church functions because the people of God give and sacrifice and support the work of the church and the spreading of the gospel. And this is part of our calling. It's not the government's job to provide for the church or any other entity's job to provide for the church because if we did, then we would be subject to them, but we're not subject to them. We're subject to God alone. And when we give to support the ministry in the church, we're submitting ourselves to God's authority. We're entrusting him to bless. We're entrusting him to provide. And use what we've given to advance the gospel and the work of the church. So they, so they made commitments in, the, in their marriages. They made commitments towards the Sabbath. They made commitments towards the temple. And understand, this wasn't legalism. It wasn't this legalistic mindset of checking the boxes so that they could better enjoy the presence of God and, and the power of God. It was so that they could experience God in a fresh new way, that they could live in the midst of the blessing of God and experience Him in all aspects of their lives. The core of the covenant wasn't the do's and don'ts. It was the disciplines of life that better shaped their hearts for God. And once their hearts were in the right spot, it was easier for them to get their actions in the right spot. And I want you to notice what I believe to be the key to all of this. Back in verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, and temple servants, along with their wives, sons, and daughters, everyone who is able to understand, and don't miss this, and who has separated themselves from the surrounding peoples, to obey the law of God. Everyone who's able to understand and who has separated themselves from the surrounding peoples to obey the law of God. They were including non-Jews. This just wasn't for Jews and Israelites. Anyone who's willing to make this covenant with God is welcome. They're not being exclusive. 
They're inviting anyone who wants to separate from the pagan world and devote themselves to Yahweh, to God, can join them. All are welcome. There's a place for anyone who wants to be a part of who we are, they said. But the striking part is that in order to do that, they had to separate from something and connect to something. Away from pagan practices and idolatry. To living under the authority of God's word. This, this is God's call on our lives. This is who God wants us to be. To walk away from sin. Away from dependence upon ourselves. Away from a desire to seek pleasure and satisfaction anywhere other than Jesus Christ and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. All are welcome to come to Jesus. All are invited to join in the covenant. There's room for everyone. But, but I want you to see that every decision of your life, every decision that we make requires us to separate from something in order to connect to something. We have to separate from some people in order to connect to people. Whether it's large or small, whether it's routine or life-changing, all of us, every decision of our lives is a decision to step away from something and to something. From the simplicity of, if I'm going to go hang out with my friends, I'm going to have to separate myself from this comfortable couch and these comfortable clothes that I don't want to get off of and get out of and get ready and leave and go to where they are to hang out with them. Now, that seems silly, right? But almost 16 years ago, when I made a covenant at the altar of the Lord, before God and before man, to marry my wife Erin. I made a covenant, as the scripture says, to walk away from the primary connection of my parents and my family so that I could primarily connect to her in relationship. Therefore, a man leave his father and mother And will cleave, will unite unto his wife. We're always called to leave from something in order to go to something. And the decision that matters most is the decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ. To go from death to life. To go from self-dependence to surrender. And once you surrender to Jesus in faith, once you give your life to Christ in faith, then God calls you to live distinctly different from the world. That's what he was calling the Israelites to do. Separate yourself from the pagan world. Connect yourself, covenant yourself, commit yourself to the word of God and to the ways of God and to the presence of God and to the spirit of God. And we're called by God to be separate. We're called by God to walk away from the ways of the world and to detach from the ways of the world and to be set apart from the world so that we can clearly be identified by Jesus. Do you look any different than the world? Does your life look any different than the life of the people out there who are living for the world? Do we as a church look any different than the world? You see, God was glorified in the rebuilding of the wall. But he was most glorified in the restoration of the people's hearts towards him. You see, their hearts were restored to God when they made a covenant to separate themselves from the world. And surrender themselves to God's way and to God's will. Are you willing to make that same commitment? Are you willing to make that same covenant today? To walk away from the sin in your life and walk towards the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to walk away from the the agenda and the plan that you feel like may be best for your life in order to walk towards and embrace the agenda and plan that I know is best for your life. 
What do you need to walk away from today so that you can walk to Jesus? So that you can walk to the next step of your faith? So that you can walk to the next opportunity that God has for you to be glorified, to glorify Him? What's God calling you to do? Do you look distinctly different? What are you willing to walk away from so that you can walk to something new and fresh and life-changing in Jesus Christ? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for his faith. Thank you that that we can learn from him and we can see that, that praying and planning and intently listening and waiting upon the Lord in our lives has great benefit. And that through him, you were able to rebuild a wall. That through him, you chose to restore your people. And God, my prayer today is that we would allow you to rebuild us. We would allow you to restore our hearts for you. That you would show us in our personal lives and in our church what it is we need to walk away from and what it is we need to walk towards so that we can better experience you, so that we can know you more intimately and serve you more effectively. God, speak to our hearts today. Help us to to see clearly what it is you're calling us to do, who it is you're calling us to be, and where it is you're calling us to go. God, may you call someone to faith in Christ today. As they've heard this sermon, as they've listened to the words that I've spoken, that something inside of them tells them that there's a void, that something's missing, and that they're looking for hope, they're longing for something, and that they'll discover that 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 longing is for you, for belonging for forgiveness, for grace, for purpose. God, speak to our hearts. As we sing this song, call people to faith in Jesus. Call people to renew the covenant of their heart before you. And shape us and mold us into who you want us to be so that we can change the world for you through the power of the gospel. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us, and we're going to sing, and we're going to worship. And just as I've prayed, I invite you, if you need Jesus Christ, if faith in Jesus is missing in your life, then come and receive him today. Let me pray with you. Let me encourage you. If you want to join our church today, we'd love to receive you. If you just need prayer or have some other decision you want to make, and you'll be here, I'll be here. Let's worship in his presence today and let him speak to our hearts and to respond in faith. Lift your voices to him. Hold in everlasting light, your glory floods the earth and fills the sky. Almighty God, there's no one like you. Mountains tremble when you speak. I'm listening, your whisper changes everything. Almighty God, there's no one like you.
Jesus, King of kings, you are the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Holy, holy, holy is your name. You are the Lord. Thanks so much for joining us for our worship experience. Whether you're joining us live on Sunday morning or whether it's at another time during the week, we're so grateful that you've chosen to participate with us this week. If you want to know more uh, about what's going on in the life of our church, make sure you're receiving our digital bulletin. You can find it on our website, but you can also contact us and give us your email address and you'll receive that every Sunday morning in your inbox. You can also give online through our website. Uh, much of our giving takes place in that manner and we're so grateful to have the technology to be able to do that. And so you can find that information on our website and here on the screen as well. Uh, to our guests, thank you for being with us today. We wanna to connect with you, we wanna to get to know you better. We have a connection card, a guest card that's available on our website as well. Please fill that out and reach out so that we can have some information about you. We wanna to get to know you better. We wanna share with you more about the life of our church. I wanna invite all of you who are joining us online to join us in person on Sunday mornings. Our small groups, our Bible study classes are meeting together at 9 a.m. in person now uh, after over a year of doing online only. And we're so grateful for that. So join us at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. There's a group, a class for you, at any age, any phase of life. And especially we want you to join us for worship at 10.30 on Sunday mornings right here uh, in our sanctuary. We're so thankful uh, for each and every one of you. We're so thankful to be able to worship together, to share God's word together, to pray together. Is there a decision that God's calling you to make? Has God spoken to you in a special way today? Maybe he's challenged you with something uh, that you need to do in your life, some areas of your life that you need to, to renew or to refocus. Uh, maybe there's a burden for some prayer needs in your life. We have a place where you can share prayer requests. And we would love to pray with you and for you for whatever it is that you need or that you want us to pray about. But most importantly, we want you to know that we want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know that in my life, uh, all the years that I've followed him and served him and trying to grow in my faith and better understand who he is and better understand his purpose for my life, I can't imagine navigating the difficulty of life without a personal relationship with him. You can surrender your heart to Christ today. We would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ and to give your life to him. And we also wanna help you get connected in ways that you can serve right here in our church, in our community. We're excited about partnering with many organizations in our community, partnering with other believers and other groups within our church to help meet the needs inside the church and outside in the community. And all that we strive to do our purpose, our mission, our goal is helping people find and follow Jesus. So come and join us and be a part of what God is doing here at South Hills Baptist Church.